Is it possible to get a quality ax for $20? Let's find out. To answer my own question, I would have said absolutely not, no. This is an ax that I have turned my nose up for, like, to, for, for years and years. I, I, I discounted it as something that was um, a gimmick, something that, um, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that you could actually produce a tool that was going to be something that was usable for $20, $21. So as I was doing some searching, I was looking for a budget ax on Amazon, something that I could recommend to someone who wants a good quality ax but doesn't want to drop $150 on a Swedish ax. And so I ordered it with very, uh, with very low expectations, to be quite honest with you. A lot of axes come through my hands, not only low budget axes, but some that are actually quite expensive, high dollar axes. I, I, I've had hundreds and hundreds of different, I have hundreds <laughs> of different options, and most of them are, are somewhat lackluster. Um, you know, I'll pull them out of the box, uh, and they're kind of him ha and they go kind of in the collection and never to be touched again. And I'll tell you what, this one, this one appealed to me. Uh, in ways that a lot of most of the, most of them don't. I, I took it out of the box now, knowing that I had uh, I had a bias towards it. I had very very low expectations, and I and I was I was you know I was curious. I took it out. I looked at it. Normally I, I would have set it aside, and you know maybe we'll get to this. Maybe we won't. But something about it really spoke to me. I grabbed it, and to me it was very American. It was it was a very American axe in that. You know, it doesn't have maybe the the sexiness or the sleek lines that you have on the Swedish axes and, and the very refined handle and the perfectly ground and, and hair popping sharp edge with, you know, with the maker's mark and all of those things that come with those beautiful axes. But it had a lot of things going for it. First off, to me, I guess what really spoke to me about it was it, 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 it is, it, it's the epitome of, I don't know, of, of kind of an American design, which is ironic because it is not a traditional American design head. This to me looks something very European. It looks something that is very similar to what we'd see like on a Baco axe, maybe some of the German things, but we have a very heavy, sturdy, almost I would say overbuilt US American hickory handle that's very nice. Lots of things really got right on this. You know, uh, axe manufacturers are notoriously f uh, notorious for skimping on the handle. You get some cheesy, crummy handle that doesn't fit the hand, super thin, trying to maximize no, 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 or no attention paid to orientation of the grain, anything like that. It's just cut, just all about cutting corners. This is actually just the opposite of it. To be quite honest with you, if I were to pay twenty dollars for this handle, for just as it came to, to do a, uh, to replace a broken handle on a tool that I already have, I would consider that to be a value, let alone the whole axle head. So, you know, that was the first thing that really spoke to me was the sturdiness. It's just, it is, I, I guess I'm having a hard time putting it into words why I think that this is so American. It's just heavy, purpose built, not a lot of flair, just made to get the job done. That, that's the impression that I, I have from it. I really like the handle. The handle in combination with the weight and the size and the balance of this ax, to me, I, I guess one of my first impressions was if I could have only one. If I could have only one, this would really suit the bill, wouldn't it? Because it's just, it's just almost the, the ideal size. You could, I could cut this tree down behind me, this 26 inch Douglas fir, with this ax. I would be able to get this tree cut down much quicker with this ax than say, maybe something like a Grand Force Brick Small Forest ax. Um, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great, great size. You know, moving to the head. So the head, of course, is drop forged, and I'm not sure the steel, some carbon steel on it, and that remains to be seen, whether it'll take edge, we'll find out here in a minute. But it is, um, in all, all initial impressions, it looks really nice. It's got a, some sort of a varnish on it, which is not a, not a big deal, but I brought a piece of sandpaper. I wanted to kind of point out the, uh, how it's hung here in the top. This is very, very nicely done. Very nicely done, as we can see. Maybe I can get that off there. Let me bring you up close here so if we can focus. You can see we have 
of course, which is my favorite way, we have those, those German style round wedges. I love those things. And they didn't just put one in, they put two in. Beautifully hung. I mean, very nice. Everything that I can see is just perfect tight. I see no gaps or spaces between anything. It is very, very nicely done. I mean, that, that's, I guess that's the word that keeps coming up is nice, nice, nice. I, I, do like, I do like it. I like it a lot. I like it so well that when Jack and I went down and we were working on our, um, uh, our bridge, I took it. <laughs> it wasn't even sharpened yet, but I took it. So let's talk about some of the things that I don't like. Well, I guess it, this is hard to say I don't like it. Of course, it, di it did not come sharp. It's certainly not sharp, but it has a decent ground grind on it. It's not going to take a lot of work. And so I thought, you know, today what we would do rather than, I mean, sometimes I think it's a little off-putting when you have you go into a nice shop and you will use all these fancy things to put an edge on a tool, uh, when really the, the reality of it is, is you simply don't need it. All you really need, and all the old timers had, were two tools. You need a good file, and you need a, a good pocket axe stone, or, or pocket stone, axe stone like this, it'll fit in your pocket. Now the file's not gonna be necessary, but for the initial fi filing, once you get it reasonably sharp and kind of a good edge on it, you'll be able to tune it and maintain it with this. This is all you need, providing you take care of it and you don't chip it. So let's, um, let's put a little edge on this thing and see if it's gonna live up to all my hype here. It's really not gonna take much to put a, an edge on this. And, and you know, actually, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even take the file to it, except for that heavy varnish that they put on there. You know, cold steel, if you're watching this video, you know what I would rather have you do than, you know, take that extra step, which is environmentally, you know, a pain to deal with, and it's unhealthy, and it's just an additional step of chemicals you don't need. Put, put the money that you're putting into this fancy paint job and, and make a, give us a sheath, even if it's just a basic, a basic sheath. But I'm gonna use a file primarily to, to remove that varnish. You can see it kind of flaking off because the grind of it is actually is very, very good. And to be completely candid, you can put a serviceable edge on a, on a tool like this just fine with, with nothing more than a file. Forest Service has done it for years. Now I'm gonna back that up a little bit. I, I tend to make the edges on these tests very thin, thinner than maybe the, the manufacturer would recommend sometimes. And the reason I do that is because it, it shows, to me, it shows the vulnerability of the steel. And that vulnerability, meaning if it's going to have a tendency to be brittle or to chip, um, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna find that out um, with it when you have a really fine thin edge there. Now be careful when you're using your file like this, of course, you know, you can go into it. The Forest Service, what they do, this, they don't have files with handles like this, but they, uh, on the tang, they put a little piece of leather, a little leather like a guard on a, on a knife or a sword. And that's not a bad idea until you kind of get your, your, t your technique going there. Now right there, what we have, I mean, that, that is a serviceable edge. That, that for most folks will, would do just fine. It's, it's not gonna, sh you're not gonna shave with it, but it's a pretty good edge. And all I really attempted to do was to go back and get, basically get rid of that varnish and clean that up a little bit, because that varnish is really gonna clog up our stone if we wanna try to sharpen with that. If you wanna take it to the next level, you know, very quickly, of course, these Lansky stones are, are, are just a wonderful little addition. They're really affordable. I think that you can find them on Amazon for, I don't know, four or $5 or so. And they're a wonderful stone. They fit well in the hand. 
they have a double grit. They have a coarse on one side and they've got a fine on the other. And the nice thing that they've done is they put a chamfer on the edge there. So it's, it's a very durable stone. It's much less likely to get the corners knocked off and get broken. Fits in the pocket really well too, or in a pack. It's a, it's a great, a great little stone. Of course, they work well with a lot, little bit of water. Kerosene's the best, but we don't always have that. So just, just use a little saliva spit on it. And uh, we're just gonna just touch that up real quick. Makes a very pleasing sound and acts against the stone, to me anyway. So after only a couple minutes with the stone, we have what I consider to be a very, very serviceable edge. It um, didn't, didn't take much trouble at all. We can see here, I like the grind, the initial grind on it. I do like, a, like an ax that's really thin here in the cheeks. You know, for me, it's for getting in and cutting deep and biting, especially when you're talking about big trees like we have here, the big firs, uh, an ax that goes in deep, bites deep. Uh, that's a narrow at the at the cheek there to me is um, is superior so let's give it a swing and see how it feels in the hand and how it holds up so this is going to be far from a comp comprehensive test uh, the only way you can really find out what an axe is made of and, and how it works with the body and how how it just works in, in general uh, is to use it under multiple conditions and multiple types of woods and different environments. You just, you essentially, you have to live with it for a while. My granddad always said, uh, you learn a lot about a man uh, if you go elk hunting with him. And the reason being is uh, you find out what type of guy he is because it, it puts him under stress. It puts him under stress and, and uh, he's cold and hungry and tired and, and that's when the true nature comes out. And the same thing goes for tools and axes. We can't just uh, have an idea of what's going to be in a perfect environment and a perfect day, but it'll give us an idea if it's going to hit hand, hand, it's going to stand up, if it's durable, but more importantly, how does it feel with my body? How does it feel in my hands? What is the balance of it? And uh, what are my impressions from that? So we'll, uh, we'll start here. This is a little, we're doing a little bit of a thinning. It's kind of a thinning operation here. And this is one of the trees that's going to come down. So let's give it a few, a few wax here. And I'm just going to kind of tuck. So that's some pretty heavy chopping there. This is the time you'll see is the handle working loose. It's not, it's solid. It's a great swinging ax, very powerful, very powerful ax for a smaller ax. My favorite part of it initially, as I'm swinging and thinking, is the shape of that handle. I'm not surprised because it is the, essentially it's the same handle that's on the Grand Force Brooks, the small forest ax and the small Scandinavian ax. And when you come to that swing, it's just perfect. That swell is out there. There's plenty of wood to hang on to. It feels very secure, very safe. It feels like it really gives me a good a good firm purchase on the ax. The swinging weight is excellent. The blade width is very nice. I was a, sometimes these fantail st styles, these big, I think that looks probably four or four and a half inches or so, they can be um, too wide. And there's so much metal trying to go into the wood, into the fibers, that they oftentimes don't bite very deep. As you saw there, this bites uh, very deep. And I think it's because it's got a pretty thin profile on it. Very thin like that. What a wonderful, what a wonderful axe. Um, I don't have issue with the axe being made in Taiwan. Don't confuse Taiwan with China. Uh, they're totally different things. There's actually some really high quality stuff coming out of Taiwan. You know, for example, one of the, my favorite knives that I own, the Spyderco bushcrafting knife, 
it's uh, made in Taiwan and it's just you know, gold standard of bushcraft knives. I don't care what anyone says, it's a wonderful knife. The fit and finish is just near perfect. But this is an excellent tool and I just don't, I don't know how they could possibly get this into my hands for $21. It, it, um, it, it's a complete mystery to me. So I'm having difficulty uh, trying to, I'm trying to summarize this. I'm trying to find the words, uh, I guess, that sum up this ax to me. What, what, is it, what, what, what does it make me feel like uh, just from my limited experience here? You know, I guess I, I'll, just words that come to mind would be faithful, trust, reliable, strong. Those are the words I, that kind of keep playing in my mind here. I like it. I like the fact that it's $20. I like the fact that um, it's something that um, if I had to go uh, beat on a railroad spike or a piece of metal or something in a pinch, uh, that it wouldn't break my heart. I like that um, if uh, my son left it out in the rain and it rusted a little bit, it wouldn't break my heart. I like that uh, <laughs> if I lost it or someone stole it, you know, all of those things, it's just an easy, simple ax that uh, is very well balanced it's very strong and very robust, and and in all honesty, um, it is going to be when I want to go for a cruise, when I want to go for a walk in the forest, and I might think that I you know might need to knock a you know trees falling down across the trail. I might be able to do something. I might be chopping in the dirt. Who knows what? Um, I might take it. I might take it over some of the other ones because I think it just is. I, I, I just think it just fits so many needs. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but, but I like it. I just, I like it. I like owning it. I like looking at it. I like, I like swinging it. I like, I like everything about it. And I especially like the price. So who's this ax for? I'd say it's for everybody. I mean, if, um, it, it's, it's, it's silly, you know, don't, don't try to justify it to your wife. To, you know, I want to buy a $160 Swedish ax. Um, unless you're, you're pretty serious about that sort of thing. I mean, I, I, I get it. I understand. I mean, you don't have to convince me. I, I, I know I, I, I have the justification machine goes into overdrive when it comes to Swedish axes. But um, really, when there's such good options like this, um, $21, uh, it makes that argument kind of flimsy um, uh, to me. Unless you just really appreciate the craftsmanship and, and you're, you know, really into forestry or woodworking, you know, then uh, I think for most guys, something like this would be great. I don't know why, um, why I haven't, uh, hadn't really seen that before or really considered it before, but it is a, it's an excellent, so far an excellent tool. But time will tell. But I, I think from what I see my initial impressions, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very good, very good. So... All right, well, thanks for watching. That's the Cold Steel Trail Boss, my review. And we'll see you guys on the next video.